Hello everyone, in this video here I'm going to show you how I did this tiger in pastels. Now this was an 8x12 size portrait and the reason why I didn't go any larger than that is as you can see from the photo in the corner there of my finished artwork, this fills every single part of the paper. So because this was going to be a full length tutorial on my Patreon channel, I didn't want to go too big knowing that this is already going to be many many hours long for the tutorial. And it turned out that this was actually a really nice size to do this on. Now just like all of my portraits, regardless of what it is that I'm working on, I do map in the eye first and get that completed before I move on to the next. Now how I tackle tigers is a little different to other subjects, but this is also how I would work on something with spots, so cheetah, jaguar, that kind of thing as well. I would be mapping in the spots and the stripes first and then putting in my base layers of that colour around it, just like what I'm doing here. Now if you've seen many of my videos here on YouTube and you're on my Patreon channel, you'll know that I think the base layers are really important. I spend that time making sure that I get them fairly close to that reference photo right from the beginning. You can see here that I haven't gone down with one set colour. That is really, I think, really important for when we come to add in our details on top. Our base layer is our foundation, so we want to make sure that we spend that time to get that accurate as we, as, you know, as we possibly can to that photo. Now the one thing that you can do is if you do struggle to do that because you're focusing on all the detail in your reference photo, is you can apply a Gaussian blur to your reference photo and that will hide all of that detail so that you can just focus on the colour and the main sets of values for your base layer. Now at your base layer stages, although I'm mentioning colour there, you don't have to worry about getting that colour 100% accurate at that time. We can obviously go ahead and correct that with our pencil layers as we build up that depth within the fur. And the, the fur details and when we come to that I find are really important in how we use that pencil. So depending on how much pressure you put on that pencil, the sharpness of the point, where you hold the barrel of the pencil and also where you have your hand positioned are all different things that are going to ultimately affect what pencil strokes you are achieving. Now I talk about this a lot in every single tutorial on my Patreon channel because I do find that it really does help. The more that we understand how we can use that pencil, it really can, in many cases with pastels especially, work very similar to using a brush with acrylics or oils. So each additional layer that we add, we can have that ability of picking up some of that pigment from the previous layer to really mix a unique colour that you may not have in your set. Now the one biggest tip that I can say that when you're working on stripes or spots is you'll see that these white details that I'm doing now over those black areas, they are varying in the direction that they are travelling. They're roughly all of a similar length, you've got a couple there a little longer, but they are a little bit more random. Now the reason for that is obviously the fur there on that part of the face especially is that much longer than the fur on the bridge of the nose for instance or on the top of the head. So we want to make sure that we've got that difference in texture in place from this point on just so that we can show that variation within that fur. This is going to help to add that depth to the portrait that we're after, that level of realism. Now the one biggest tip as well is obviously to really pay attention to that fur detail that you are creating. You really want to make sure that we are focusing on the right length, not just necessarily the thickness of those fur strokes, but as I say, the length is really quite important. If I was to make the fur as long on the top of the head as I have on the side of the face and on the neck for instance, I'm going to make him look far too fluffy. So I really need to make sure that when I'm going for the type of realism that I'm after, that I'm not only focusing on the fur direction, but as I say, the length and the thickness of those pencil strokes as well. So I deliberately split this tutorial into two parts. They're both about three and a half hours long, so I'm able to really show you in considerably slower footage how I move in that pencil to create all of these first strokes that I'm referring to. I also list all of the colours that I'm using and I mention those colours when I am using them within the tutorial so that anybody who wants to follow along can do so very easily. Now this was my first wildlife subject with using the colour pan pastels. Before I've only used the black, white and the grey to do my elephant and my lion tutorial. But what I wanted to do is see how they were for something like this, wondering how their colour saturation were and just how vibrant I could get my base layer. That's the one thing that I absolutely love about pan pastels and the more that I use them, the more that I love them. The colour saturation as you can see here for my base layers is beautiful. One thing that I will say with them as well is a very small amount goes a very, you know, goes a very long way. I can see that they'll last a bit longer than the soft pastel sticks and I know that the price point of pan pastels does put a lot of people off but from the, the way that I've used them here I've barely even, you know, barely used the top layer of my pan pastels at all for this entire portrait.
Now, the one biggest tip that I can say is when you are working on anything with stripes or spots, it w- the, the principle would be the same, is you'd have to make sure that they are positioned and traveling in the right direction. Now, what I mean by that is if you look at the top of the eyes here, you've got those black stripes within those white sections. They curve around in a specific way. And in that instance there, it's because it's the top of the eye socket. These stripes are going to be following that anatomy, that skeletal and muscular structure under the skin. So we need to make sure that we get these stripes and the placement as close as we can to that reference photo. Now, if you have a couple of the stripes that are one or two millimeters in a different position, that is not going to matter. You want to go for close as you can there. But what I'm talking about is how they curve. That curvature of the stripes is following that anatomy of that animal. If we don't get that accurate, your end result is ultimately not going to look like that subject and how it should. So the perspective is then going to look incorrect, which is obviously not what we want. So with something like this already, you can see how many layers I've been adding and how much depth I'm working on building with each additional layer. Now, I'm only able to do that because I have made sure that at my initial layers, I haven't filled the tooth of the paper. Now, regardless on your your method that you choose to put your base layer down, whether it's pan pastels, soft pastel sticks or the pencils on their own, you want to be making sure that you are only putting this the minimum amount down so that you can then apply additional layers with your pencils on top to add all that depth and detail that you that you want. You don't ever want to get to the point where you are restricted with how much detail that you can add. If you fill the tooth of the paper, your pencils will feel like they almost glide over the surface. Minimal pigment will come out and it is just very difficult to then add any kind of detail at all. Now, the one thing that I would say is if you have come across that, I hate throwing artwork away, especially if you come this far on the portrait, for instance. So what I would be doing is using a workable fixative to get that tooth back to the paper so that you can then apply more layers and more details on top. Now, that being said, it it is easier to avoid filling the tooth of the paper than having to go down the route of a fixative. The fixative will adjust the colour and it will adjust the tonal values within your piece. So I personally don't like using them. So I want to avoid filling the tooth of the paper as much as I can. Now I do have a video on Patreon showing you how to avoid filling the tooth of the paper. It's all real time. It's a live voiceover. I'm showing you how I'm using my soft tools or my eye makeup applicators to actually then pick up that pan pastel pigment and apply it directly to the paper. So that video shows you how that process can be done to avoid filling the tooth of the paper at all. It is the one biggest complaint with pan pastels that I've seen and that it's very easy to fill the tooth of that paper. I think the reason for that is that the pigment in the pan pastels is quite soft. It's lovely to work with. They blend beautifully. But I do think that therefore leaves it to be easy enough to fill that tooth of the paper on your initial layer. So what I would be doing is making sure that you are really not digging at that pan pastel. You really don't want nowhere near as much pigment there. Just enough to get you a fine layer just like what you can see that I've got here. Now when it comes to the white stripes you'll notice here that I haven't gone with a white base layer that's really important you want to make sure that you go with a couple of shades darker so that your white details will then show up on top. With white fur you do want to be making sure you work from dark to light in some instances. There are also many cases where I want to make sure that I get that fur as white as I, I want to so I will go uh, with a very light grey add my whites on top and then add some of my shadows in between. So it really does depend on the situation and the fur type that we're trying to create but the one thing that we want to make sure is that we always make sure we're able to get that white as bright as it needs. So whether or not that means as I've said not to make your base layers too dark or to make sure that you've then added plenty of your white details on top whatever way it is that you're having to work we want to make sure that we've got that brightness within the white stripes there to really aid that level of contrast that's really important. Now something that I've already mentioned in this tutorial is the fur direction. It is crucial. If we get this fur direction incorrect, we are going to completely change the look of this animal. So here on the side of the face, if I was to be making these pencil details far too horizontal and too straight, I would ultimately be making the face of the tiger appear too wide. So I really want to make sure that I am really studying that photo to make sure that I've got this fur direction as accurate as I possibly can. So you'll notice here that the fur direction starts to slope away towards the bottom corner. This is indicating now that the cheek here is starting to join up to the lower section and the base of the neck. So we really want to make sure that we are getting that as accurate as we possibly can.
Now something else to consider and that's also really important is the fur on the bridge of the nose which is the area that I've already done as you can see and also the muzzle that I'm working on now. You really want to make sure that we are shortening our pencil strokes here to replicate that short stubbly fur that they've got here. We don't want to be making it the same length as the other areas on the side of the face because as of what I've already mentioned we'll therefore be making it look like they've got a really furry muzzle. So although that would be really cute in the reference photo and obviously in realism that is not what we're going for. So really try and get into the habit of studying that photo to see where your pencil strokes need to be shortened and where they need to be lengthened. Now in some cases on the bridge of the nose there might only be little dots that would replicate that fur direction. Here I'm using pencil strokes that as you can see are not dots but they're also not long lines neither they're somewhere in between so it really does depend on that reference photo study that see what that is telling you your reference photo has given you all that information that's needed now with big cats also with dogs all of those kinds of subjects normally you are going to have shorter fur on the on the front section of the face so above the nose and on the muzzle area but there isn't necessarily to say that that is the rule for everything. So as I say, really study that photo, zoom into those areas to see how long, how short these pencil marks need to be made. One of my favourite parts about any portrait is adding in the whiskers. I think it finishes off that portrait, it really does add that extra level of realism. It might only be a couple of pencil strokes but it makes all the difference. My biggest tip would be when you're working on the muzzle here is don't add them in too soon. You really want to be leaving the whiskers right until the very end. Now these whiskers they overlap everything else. They are in front of the fur, the nose, the muzzle so we really do want to be making sure we leave them right till the very last layer. Now the one thing that I will say is just remember to put them in. I have in one instance done a pet portrait and I photographed it and I was about to send it to the client and I realised I hadn't put them in which seems bizarre because they're such a crucial part of the portrait but when you're working on anything regardless of what it might be and you think right, I'll leave that till the end or I'll adjust that later it might even be something in the eye or one of the stripes might not be right the one thing that I would say is make a little note, maybe a sticky note somewhere on the side of your easel to go and make those changes if you have decided to leave until the end of the portrait because these tiny little changes and in this instance adding the whiskers which is a very important thing if we leave those out and not make those changes our artwork's not going to be as good as the potential that we could have if we go and add those details in. The really beneficial thing with working with pastels is it's very forgiving. Even if you had photographed something and you thought it was finished but you look at it a couple of days later and you think there's something that I want to change about that. We have the ability to do that. Now the, the one more thing as well that you can do is if you have finished a portrait or let's say it's maybe you're a bit frustrated with that artwork, it's not going to plan, it's not looking how you want, put that artwork aside for a couple of days and then go back to it later once you've got fresh eyes, you know you haven't been staring at it for however long on your easel, that can really help to break up that process, really then start to work on it fresh again. So that's the one thing that I would say and it's something that I do with the portraits that I think are finished. I'll put them away in a drawer for a couple of days, I'll then get them back out and I'll see if there's any changes that I need to make to it before I photograph it and call it finished. So now that I've got a good amount of the face here finished, you'll start to see now how the contrast is playing such an important role in that level of realism. Now throughout this I have not focused overly on the colour, it's more about my highlights, my shadows and getting those as close to that reference photo as bright and as dark as I need in order to get that depth that I keep referring to. Now I speak about this an awful lot in my YouTube and Patreon videos because it's one of the most common questions that I'm asked and that is how do I know what colour to select, how do I know the order of which to lay that colour down? Well ultimately the exact colour is not what I focus on at all. When I do select my colours I'm, I'm trying to pick whether or not it's on the warmer end of the colour wheel or a cooler end of the colour wheel and then how light and how dark I need to have that colour. That's really how I select the pencils in front of me. But there are many times, and you see this on my Patreon videos, because it is that much slower, you will see I will go and pick up a colour and it's not the right one, I'll replace it with another. But now that I've got a good amount of this face in here you can really see the contrast is the key. I could draw this tiger under fluorescent lighting and it would still look realistic if I had my contrast in place. All it would look is that I've taken it under artificial light. And the one biggest thing to consider as well is this tiger, let's say it was taken, the photo was on a sunny day. If the cloud cover went over the sun, the white balance of this photograph would completely change. There'd be a lot more of those purples, more of those magentas colours within this fur. 
So it's the one thing that we can not have to focus on quite the same. And the reason why I talk about it a lot in my videos is because we really do put a lot of stress on trying to get the exact colour. If only I had that right colour pencil, that soft pastel stick, that pan pastel, then my artwork would be realistic. But unfortunately, it's just not as easy as that. If the contrast within a portrait is not achieved, that artwork will be flat. You could have two portraits side by side and if one's the exact colour and the colour is spot on but the contrast is not great, that is not going to have as much attention as the, f the artwork next to it where the contrast is really striking but the colour's ever so slightly off. Because the one thing to consider as well is no one is going to have that specific reference photo of that tiger. They're not going to know the, the white balance of that photo. Now obviously we want to go for as close as we possibly can, of course we do, but what I'm the one thing that I, I and I explain this a lot is because we really do hold ourselves back worrying about the exact colour. Now that's short pencil that I'm using here at the moment, that is a dark brown of the pit pastel. If I didn't have that all I'd be laying down is a lighter burnt umber colour and going over the top with my black carbofello. If you're looking for a brown that you think's got a bit more of that burnt sienna redder colour to it but you don't have one of those pencils in your set, just mix a bit of a red in with a burnt umber and you'll get something very very close. So the colour is not as important as we give it credit, it's the contrast. If you look at these black stripes here on the body, it's they are nice and dark against that soft out of focus effect that I'm creating within the fur itself. If I didn't get these black stripes as dark as they are at the moment, this whole section here would look flat. So as I'm coming to the end of this tiger here, I'll just quickly mention one of the most common questions that I'm asked and that's about a final fixative. I don't use any fixatives on my work, workable or final, because I don't like how they change the colour and the tonal values. My preference is to mount them. I then put a bit of the glassine paper, which I use to also package up the portraits, but I cut that to size and leave that on top of the artwork and under the mount. I then tell my clients to get it framed as soon as they can and once it's behind glass there is going to be nothing that can smudge that artwork anyway. I would much rather go down that route and know that my portrait and the colours, the whites are as white as they were when I finished the artwork rather than put a fixative over the top to seal it and then all of my colours shift. Something else to bear in mind as well is unless you apply a heavy layer or lots of little layers which again are going to continue to adjust that colour. A fixative very rarely actually fixes all of the pastel to that paper. If you apply a fixative and you still run your hand across the artwork, you still will get pigment on your fingers. So for me, it's just not worth it. But that is my personal preference and you will find that fixatives are going to be very individual to that artist. As I say, there's no right or wrong answer. You'll find out what works best for you. As I say, the very last thing I've put in here is the whiskers. The biggest tip that I can give anybody for doing whiskers is to make sure that you draw them in one continuous movement. Try and get that pencil in your hand used to moving that pencil quickly. I do have a specific video on Patreon, I've got two or three actually, on how to do whiskers, really showing how I move that pencil to do that all in real time with a live voiceover. So I'll link my Patreon channel in the description below if the tutorials there are of interest. So I really hope this tutorial here on YouTube was useful. If it was, I'd really appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up because it really does help the channel. And if you want to get notified of future content, then hit the subscribe and the bell button. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll be uploading another video very soon.